So hi, I'm Margaret Gam. I'm Director of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations. The Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, the Meskwaki and Ho-Chunk Nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. To help you start your own exploration of these histories of Iowa and its people, we encourage you to take a look at the links provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. So uh, today we will hear from Emily Martin, Adjunct Assistant Professor in Bookbinding and Book Arts at the University of Iowa Center for the Book. Here in Special Collections and Archives, we are thrilled to have well over 100 works created by Emily, as well as her papers going back to the start of her career. Emily last spoke at a Bibliophiles event in 2016 about her creations interpreting themes in Shakespeare. This continues to be a theme in her work with a particular focus on women in Shakespeare. This time, Emily, who is an active member of the Movable Book Society, joins us to talk about movable books. Emily, over to you. All right. Um, thank you. I, uh, I want to start off by um, thanking um, Elizabeth Reardon uh, for inviting me to do this presentation. And I'd also like to thank Eric Ensley, curator of our books and maps and special collections, and Damien Erig. Uh, who's the curator at the John Martin Rare Book Room over in the Hardin Library for the Health Sciences. They were both really invaluable for my um, presentation today. And most of the books that I'm gonna show you are in those, those libraries. So if you are local, um, you can go and see them in person there. And um, so uh, because we are not for, uh, live, um, I'm gonna do it as a, as a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so here we are. And um, as the title says, pop-ups are, uh, and move, well, movables especially, are much older than people think. And um, the, uh, most people are familiar with the sort of modern spectacular pop-ups of books that are aimed primarily at children, although many of them appeal to all ages. And those types of books are relatively new in the history of pop-ups and movable books. And so I'm going to start off by defining my terms here. And um, when I refer to movables, I'm talking about the parts of books that are moved by the viewer and pop-ups are the parts of books that are moved by the book itself. And by that, I mean opening a book or turning a page. And in a, indeed, in a sense, all books are movable, but I'm gonna talk about books where there is movement other than the standard paging through that happens in um, common book forms. And I am, um, a member of the Movable Book Society, which is an international organization of collectors, historians, book dealers, paper engineers, artists, and enthusiasts. And this organization was founded by Anne Montanero Staples in 1993, and the Movable Book Society published a book commemorating the 10th anniversary of that founding in 2014. And the book cover, has a hidden device, which when open reveals a facsimile honoring the inventor of the first known movables, which is Matthew Paris. And books with movable parts were made as early as the 13th century. And this English monk, Matthew Paris, who was born in 1200 and died in 1259, lived in the St. Albans Abbey in Hertfordshire, England, and is credited with being the first maker of both the fold-out flap and the vovel or turning wheel. And this commemorative device was designed by Robert Sabuda, a well-known contemporary paper engineer, and many of you might be familiar with his books. And here, Robert presents a facsimile vovel and uses a lift flap to activate the pop-ups of the self-portrait of Matthew Paris. And Paris was the Abbey's historian and he embarked on an illustrated story of humankind from creation to his present day, Chronica Majora, a three volume work 
Um, two volumes are held in the Corpus Christi College Libraries in Cambridge, and the third is in the British Library. And Paris is credited with inventing the first known movable, the, the wheel, the vovel, from the Latin verb volver, meaning to turn or roll around. And prior to the invention, monks would have to rotate heavy books that contain circular charts made up of columns when calculating Easter and other holy days. The vovel allowed the monks to rotate only the circular chart, not the entire cumbersome book. And I'll return to Vauvel's at the end of my presentation. And for those of you who want to get more into the history of um, that, I, I, I will mention here, this is my favorite book on early movables. It's Interactive and Sculptural Printmaking in the Renaissance from Suzanne Carr Schmidt. And it's published by Brill Studies in Intellectual History in 2018. And I believe it will soon be in the collection of the um, special collections. And it's from Suzanne's book that I borrow this illustration of a map of the itinerary from London to Jerusalem for the Historia Anglorum circa 1250 to 1259 uh, in, held in the British Library. And this shows Matthew Paris's second movable invention, the lift flap or the fold out map. And I'm gonna quote from Suzanne's book here. The monk imitated the map's movements as he worked its pages and flaps and the multi-sensorial experience of that working and the places it described constructed a performative setting in which the monk could realize an imagined pilgrimage to the Holy Jerusalem. And this sensorial experience is a major component of the viewing of books containing pop-ups and movables. It's more than a simple reading experience. The viewer is interacting with the book. It's an involvement beyond reading. Lift flaps and bobels are also extremely versatile devices, as you'll see from the assortment of examples that I'll be showing this evening. And not all of the, not all lift flaps are complicated. And I'll now show you a couple of newish ephemera pieces. This first one is from the Bodleian Bibliographical Press, where I spent a very happy a uh, month in the fall of 2018. And this is printed from old wood blocks to make this pair of figures. And the, um, the second one I'm gonna show you is a, whoop, is a reprint of an advertisement from the library company in Philadelphia. And this is a very simple single flap, but it, um, it allows the entire scene to be altered. This is an advertisement for coconut. And we're gonna move forward to the 16th century. And here we see De Humani Corporis Fabrica Laborum Epitome from 1543 one of the most influ influential books on human anatomy by Andreas Vesalius. He was born in Brussels in 1541, uh, which was then a part of the Habsburgs, Netherlands. He died in 1564 in what is now a part of Greece. And Vesalius was a 16th century anatomist, physician and author. And he's often referred to as a founder of human, modern human anatomy. He revolutionized the study of biology and the practice of medicine by his careful description of the anatomy of the human body. He described, he based his descriptions on dissections he made himself and then wrote and illustrated this first comprehensive textbook of anatomy. This book has anatomical elements um, that can be cut out uh, such as the liver here, and layered to rec replicate human anatomy. And this book was intended for teaching purposes. This next book is from the 17th century and it's Catoptrum Microcosmicum, um, printed in Augsburg in 1619 by Johann Remelin with illustrations by Lucas Killen. And Remelin um, designed male and female paper figures using a series of overlapping flaps. And um, it, this book was in, uh, the overlapping flaps were to illustrate the successive layers of the human body. And this book was intended more for the curious lay person 
rather than, um, than a, a medical student or a physician. And Remelin's work was a popular science bestseller of its day, and it was reprinted numerous times. And these are little modesty flaps um, that were included. And you'll see um, anatomical lift flaps in contemporary trade editions and also in artist books, such as this, these next books that I'm gonna show you. So contemporary artists have been making use of anatomical lift flaps in a variety of ways. Body of Inquiry, a triptych opening to a corporeal codex by Casey Gardner from Set in Motion Press was printed in 2011. And as you can see, this is a triptych. Um, it's a letterpress printed, but the, holding a sewn codex within the subject's torso. And so as you open the three flaps of the tip triptych, you get to this interior codex. And I'm gonna take you through some of the, the layers of this. And um, this interior codex, held in the torso of a printed female anatomical model unfolds the story of the scientific journey that an actual anatomical model inspired for this work. And Casey Gardner was inspired from the enigma posed by the model's enviable composure despite her utter available viscera, uh, available and exposed viscera. For years, Casey referred to her as Our Lady of Serene Evisceration and marveled at her inner workings. And you go through the various layers with the text involved. And so this is a little video of one of the elements. And this is the back of the book, um, and it kind of references a Vauvel with a circular presentation of the various possibilities, such as hoping with the eye of an egress or believing as a pop quiz, but this particular circle does not move. The next book I'm gonna discuss is Atomi Anatomia Botanica by Radha Pandey. Um, this was printed uh, in Iowa City. And this book invites the viewer to experience three species of flowering plants that shape the artist's understanding of her natural environment. And I'm gonna show you the Southern Magnolia first. Um, and this, as you can see, has lift flaps um, to show the anatomy of the plant. Um, the second one is the red hibiscus. And Rada drew her inspiration from the illustrative styles of these images from 16th to 18th century European and American botanicals and the Mughal <clears throat> um, architectural motifs. And you can see how the movable aspect and mechanisms used for these illustrations also reference the 16th century anatomical flat books and they function in a similar fashion. Rada is an alumni of the University of Iowa Center for the Books MFA program in Book Arts, and her studies for this book were done here at the University of Iowa Libraries. This book has been letterpress printed using reduction linoleum cuts, handset metal type with pushwar and photopolymer plates on handmade paper. And very briefly, we're gonna return to the 16th century for this book, Ophthalmodulaya, I believe, Dresden, 1583 from George Bardish. Um, and this is the first systematic work on eye diseases and is also notable for being printed in the vernacular rather than the Latin or Greek. This is also from the, the Martin Rare Book Room in the Hardin Library. And this is another view of the different layers. And that brings us to this book, which is a collaborative book between Julie Chen and Clifton Metter, who are contemporary artists, and has a bit of an eye of a nod to the eye of the um, eye anatomy we just saw. This is called How Books Were Printed from 2010. And this contemporary book presents the layers of book definitions in a series of lift flaps in all four directions. And the lift flaps engage the viewer in peeling back those layers of meaning, somewhat like you would 
go through the anatomy of the eye. You read this book while the book looks back to you, back at you, meeting your gaze. So I'm going to take you through the flaps. And this, what is a book? A book is an experience. Reading creates an intimate space. A book contains time. The book is a vehicle for meaning. The reader brings the book into existence. The power of a book is based on your willingness to surrender your prejudices and beliefs for the duration of your interaction with it. But the book doesn't really speak. Your own mind is doing all the talking. A book starts with an idea, but it ends with the reader. And I'm gonna move on to the next book, which is also by an alumni, alumna of the um, Center for the Book. This is Elizabeth Munger's book, The Story of a Table Setting. And this book uses very simple fold out pages and the fold outs allow her to expand her storytelling and keep the viewer engaged as she anim animates the silverware of a proper place setting with a story that she learned from her mother and grandmother. And I offer this brief synopsis. In the kingdom of the placemat where there is a castle, the plate, the evil knight Fork and his son Salad Fork are from the far off country of Left. The Forks and their army invade the kingdom, setting up their tent, the napkin. They want to steal Princess Spoon as a bride for the Salad Fork. The king enlists the aid of the very tall knight, Sir Knife, to battle the evil forks. After a great battle, the salad and the salad forks army is destroyed and only they remain. Princess Spoon and Sir Knight have also fallen in love. A crystal palace is built right by the castle for the happy couple. To this day, whenever you visit the table, you will find Sir Knife the right below the crystal tower protecting Princess Spoon. The thwarted fork and salad fork are left with their napkin tent on the other side of the castle. And with that, we return to the first Vauvel of Matthew Paris. And um, this next device is also from Suzanne Carr Schmitz. This is a decoding Vauvel which has a movable dial in the center, which allows you to um, decipher an encrypted message. And um, this is a, an example of an uncut woodcut volvel and dials, which are not uncommon to be found where um, they were meant to be cut up and assembled, but for whatever reason, they remain on their, um, their base sheet. And so um, in Suzanne's book, she includes it as a, you can make your own facsimile. And Eric Ensley at the university has um, recently introduced me to this um, uncut scientific device um, for studying astronomy. And it's found in this book, which is a brief and most easy introduction to the astrological judgment of the stars written in London in 1598. And it was written in the English vernacular of the time. And I'm really looking forward to spending more time with this book and making copies and constructing my own facsimile for this uh, anatom astronomical device. And, um, and now we're gonna move on to some contemporary uses of the Vauvel device. This is subject, verb, object from Ellen Knudsen of Crooked Letter Press, 2012. And I'm going to paraphrase from Ellen's website. Ellen developed this particular vovel as a word game that grew from a need to process feelings of anger. The game has no beginning, no end, and no way to win. The turning, fitting, and order of the words can lead to clarity or confusion. The reader plays with the language and considers some of the options about what we want, need, and have. The concept behind the book stems from her frustration and anger that she felt towards art criticism and other academic writing. Academic language seemed intended to control its audience, to exclude outsiders, and is not meant to clarify the subject for a reader. 
It takes the beauty and passion out of language and in turn out of people. Ellen Svovel pokes at this idea by doing something similar. It uses simplistic language and structure to force the reader to attempt a visual organization of the things we cannot put in order, our desires. And this is also letterpress printed. Coincidentally, this second Vauvel also pokes at the use of jargon. And this is Dan Mayer's Mabo's Jargonator from election 2000 wonk wheel from 2001. And it lets us all play spin doctor with the language from the 2000 election. And for those of you who um, have forgotten, that was the, the time of the hanging Chad. And so the three wheels allow you to construct uh, any number of phrases, uh, critical or uh, humorous or snarky, however you care to interpret that. And um, I myself have um, made use of the Vauvel forms somewhat recently. I, um, I used them for my Oscar Wilde book, which was printed in 2020. And I made two sided Vauvels um, where the uh, playwright Oscar Wilde trades lines with his characters from the importance of being earnest. And Wilde often voiced his own opinions through the mouths of his characters. So it seemed appropriate to, um, to use the Vauvel form. And so I'm gonna show you this video of the, of the book. Oscar Wilde, In Earnest and Out, is an artist book by me, um, Emily Martin. And I became aware of Oscar Wilde's plays in college when I took a class where we studied them. He was celebrated um, during his time in the late 1800s as a writer of all sorts, and in particular as a playwright. He was at the height of his celebrity when he was accused of being a sodomite, um, sued and not only lost the suit, but was then convicted of committing acts of gross indecency with other male persons under Section 11 of the 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act. And this act was not fully repealed in England until 2003. The Importance of Being Earnest was one of his most famous plays. It's a social commentary and very witty, and it has a, a number of characters who trade lines with each other throughout the play. And this artist book is a series of Vauvels in which Oscar and five of the characters from his play have uh, a dialogue of sorts using lines from the play and then Oscar's lines are all from other of his writing. Algernon. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Oscar, the public have an insatiable curiosity to know everything except what is worth knowing. Lady Bracknell, to lose one parent may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both seems like carelessness. And Oscar, morality is simply the attitude we adopt towards people we personally dislike. This prism, the good and happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. Oscar, experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes. Jack, it is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life 
he has been speaking nothing but the truth. And Oscar, most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinion, their lives a mimicry, their passions a quotation. Gwendolyn, in matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. And Oscar, to get into the best society nowadays, one has either to feed people, amuse people, or shock people, that is all. Okay, and thank you.